Greetings to the distinguished guests, the academic community and fellow students. My name is Kanya Burns Mamashe. I'm a master's student in the political and international studies department at Rhodes University. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome and thank everyone for making the time to attend the virtual launch of the Palgrave Handbook of African Women's Studies under the theme African Feminist Contributions to Decolonization, Activism and Pedagogy. This book launch is hosted jointly by the Political and International Studies Department and the African Studies Center at Rhodes University, the Center for Women and Gender Studies at Nelson Mandela University, along with the Department of Political Science at Babcock University and the History Department at the University of Texas. It is such an honor to be in conversation with prominent scholars. I trust that by the end of this launch, we all would have gained a deeper and broader understanding of the various contours of African feminisms. I'd like to extend gratitude to all the contributors and the co-editors for producing this kind of work and creating intellectually stimulating spaces for emerging scholars. Furthermore, I would also like to thank my colleagues for availing themselves and contributing to this important conversation that we will be having today. I would like to urge everyone, more especially the contributors and the panelists, to keep their cameras on so that the session is more um, interactive. We are running a tight program, so I'd like to kindly urge the panelists and the contributors to stick to the allocated times. Just to run through the program very quickly, we're very fortunate to have with us Professor Innocent Sindo, who is the Dean of Humanities and the Director of the African Studies Center with us today. So once I'm done with the opening remarks, I will hand over to Professor Innocent Sindo, who will do the welcoming remarks for five minutes. Thereafter, Prof. Sindo will hand over to Dr. Magada, who is our Head of Department, who will introduce the co-editors and our facilitator. Dr. Magadla will hand over to the co-editors, Professor Jakob Haliso and Professor Toyen, who will introduce the Palgrave Handbook of African Women's Studies for 10 minutes. The co-editors will then hand over to our facilitator, Dr. Mtero, to facilitate the panel discussion. The panel discussion has about 35 minutes set aside, so each contributor has about five minutes to speak to their chapter. The last contributor will then hand back to Dr. Mtero, our facilitator, who will introduce our two discussants who will be given 10 minutes each. Then we will have a question and answer session for about 20 minutes and end off with a vote of thanks by Dr. Babalo Makotwana. I hope that everyone enjoys the launch and I now hand over to Professor Msindo. Thank you very much, uh, Kanya, for the introductory remarks. I think you have taken uh, the leaf out of me and I will speak for a very short while. I would like at this stage to recognize the presence of my elder, a very senior elder in the field, uh, Professor uh, Toyin Falola. Uh, thank you, Professor Falola, for the work you're doing. Uh, 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 I really want to recognize your presence again. Um, it is befitting that uh, we receive this honor and the kindness are uh, extended to us by the, this initiative uh, uh, of having to have to introduce this uh, session at this moment. I want to thank you all colleagues um, for the work that you've been do doing that is leading to this virtual launch at this point. Uh, studies of women um, have predominantly been uh, dominated by scholars in the global north, and therefore it is a very uh, encouraging, encouraging uh, thing that we are sitting here to receive a launch of such a very ambitious book uh, project, uh, for which I want to thank all of you. I would like to thank the Department of Political and, and International Studies uh, from which uh, um, uh, some of the colleagues have been involved in this work uh, emanate, as well as the initiative from the Nelson Mandela University as well. Uh, I would like at this, at, at, at this moment to actually appreciate and recognize the following. 
uh, the co-editors of the Power Grave Handbook of Women uh, Studies and uh, their collaborative partners, uh, Professor uh, Ola Jumoke uh, Jacob Haliso of uh, Babok University, as well as uh, Professor Falola that I already recognize from the University of Texas. I would like to appreciate and thank also the contributors uh, in this following order very quickly. Professor Zaitu Mateveni from the University of Forte, uh, Professor Yolande Boka from Queen's University, uh, Dr. Kanyile Mlochwa from uh, University of KwaZulu-Natal, Dr. Tambile Masola from uh, the University of Cape Town, uh, Dr. Divya Bana from uh, the University of KwaZulu-Natal, as well as Professor Olua Bunmi Adejumo from Obafemi Owolowo University. I want to also uh, thank and acknowledge the facilitator, Dr. Shingi Mutero uh, from Rhodes University, as well as the organizing team, Dr. Spokazima Gala from Rhodes University and uh, Dr. Babalwa Magokwana from Nelson Mandela University. Uh, thanks goes again to uh, the master's student from Rhodes University and Nelson Mandela University in this following order, uh, Kanya, who is before us and who just introduced me, uh, as well as Nompumele Lobabeli, uh, Zikombore Romazianga, Spoka Zitawu, Offense Maake, Nigel Machiha, uh, uh, and all those who have been involved in this program. I'm really thankful and grateful that this is being launched at this moment. We wished to have hosted all of you uh, for this event physically. And I must confess that um, I still have uh, a, a lot to do to ensure that Professor Toin Falola will come here one of those days. I'm hopeful he is hearing me at this moment. I don't want to belabor you colleagues, but um, please have a good lunch and enjoy this moment. I'm supposed to be rushing to join an inaugural lecture that will start um, within about an hour from now. And so I will stay with you for a short while and then just suddenly disappear. But otherwise, please enjoy the moment. And uh, we are very delighted that you could get this ambitious uh, initiative to fruition. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Spoga Zimagada. Uh, thank you so much. Please unmute. Kazi, I think just increase your volume. More? We still need, we still can't hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me better now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank it's much you. better. But, but. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So I'll start over by thanking the Dean of Humanities, Professor Mtindo, for welcoming our guest and attendees. So Kazi, we can't, we can ask yeah, you. Are, are your, are your headphones still plugged into the computer? Yeah, we can't, we can barely can hear you. Can you increase the volume on the um, actual laptop, maybe? Let's see. Is the microphone. Can you hear me now? No. Nope. Can you hear anything? Okay, so I'll just walk over to Tanya's office and do my remarks from there. Please give me a few seconds. Okay, colleagues. Okay, let me mute myself on my own computer. Sorry about this. The beauty of working with young people. Much better. I'm sorry. sorry. 
sorry. I've just had to ask Mbumi, who's just saved the day, to take my own laptop because I can't log off. Otherwise, the whole web will collapse. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me now. Um, so I, I was just saying that I would like to uh, welcome, especially the students that are here. We are over 200 in this room now. I would like to thank the uh, thank and welcome the third year students that are being taught by Ms. Cora Knowles. We borrow the theme of this launch from the title of Knowles' course, which is called African Feminist Contribu Contributions to Decolonization, Activism, and Pedagogy. I would also like to welcome the first year students that are currently doing Introduction to Comparative Politics, which is taught by Dr. Bongani Nyoga. The first two themes of that course examine the gender question in political institutions in Southern Africa and West Africa. Welcome to, to Dr. Shingimdero's honors class, which is called From Triple Oppression to Intersectional Intersectionality, an Introduction to African Feminist Theory. It has not always been the case that students in undergraduate and postgraduate studies in political science are introduced to gender and feminist scholarship in Africa. In a critical review of 61 undergraduate course outlines from seven political and international studies departments in South Africa, published in 2020, Professor Sally Matthews found that the texts prescribed to students studying in undergraduate politics in South Africa are indeed, I quote, mostly by white men, mostly written by white people, and mostly written by authors based in Europe and North America, end quote. This means that this moment where gender scholarship is taught across courses, whether entirely focused on gender or other fields such as political philosophy, political theory, international studies, and comparative politics needs to be sustained and normalized across political science and the humanities as we have come to do with race. As Grace Ida Hossa, who is a graduate of the politics department in Makanda, correctly points out in her chapter titled Decolonizing the Curriculum on African Women and Gender Studies in the Palgrave Handbook of African Women's Studies, she says, and I quote, any decolonization project must ask what is taught, why it is taught, who teaches it, and who is privileged or undermined by such teaching, and what are the learning experiences of the students. It requires acknowledging that knowledge and the curriculum are contextually dependent and co-constructed." The Palgrave uh, Handbook of African Women's Studies that is edited by Professor Jakub Haliso and Falola has 132 chapters. It is 2,500 and 19 pages long. It is indeed pretty, uh, disciplinary. It brings together scholars in history, sociology, political science, archaeology, sociology, health and life sciences, uh, linguistics, literary and cultural studies, philosophy, economics, development studies, law, psychology, and many more. As the core editors point out, by achieving this pluridisciplinarity, the handbook successfully resituates African women's studies in these fields, finding new relevance for it within traditional disciplines and broader academic studies, while conversely extending concepts, models, theories, and, and understanding of those fields to an, to an enlargement of our scope and methods. By this integrative process, the handbook has made it impossible for African studies and studies of Africa to remain the same as before. Having demonstrated both the versatility of its constitutive fields in enlivening African women's studies and also the centrality of women and gender in Africa to their own subjects, premises, and perspectives." End quote. For this mighty achievement, we have Professor Jakub Haliso and Professor Falola to thank. Professor Jakub Falo, uh, fa, um, sorry, Professor Jakub Haliso is a professor of political science 
at Bangkok University in Nigeria. She has published 10 books and dozens of articles and book chapters. She is editor of the Journal of Contemporary African Studies and serves on the, on the editorial board of African Affairs and the Journal of International Women's Studies. She is currently the Dean of the Veronica Adeleke School of Social Sciences at Babcock University. Welcome, Professor Jakub Haliso. Our elder, Professor Toyin Falola, is a professor of history and university distinguished teaching professor and Jacob and Francis Sanger and Mosica Chair in the Humanities at the University of Texas in Austin. He has published over 150 books, including multiple Calgrave handbooks on several African themes in philosophy, social ethics, folklore, oral traditions, Islam, and indigenous education. He has received over 30 lifetime career awards and 14 honorary doctorates. Welcome, Professor Falola. Lastly, it is a pleasure to introduce the facilitator who is my colleague, Dr. Shingi Mtero. Dr. Mtero teaches and researches in international relations theory, crit critical security studies, international criminal justice, African peace and security, African feminisms, and African gender studies. She holds a PhD in international studies from the Department of Political and International Studies at Rose University. Her PhD research explored the politics of international criminal justice with a particular focus on the agency of African state and non-state actors in their engagements with the International Criminal Court. I will now hand over to Professor Jakub Haliso, whom I'm told will speak on behalf of the co-editors and she will then hand over to our facilitator. Welcome. Thank you very much. Dr. Sipokazi Magadla, Head of Department of Politics at Rhodes University. Um, my warm greetings to the Dean of Humanities at Rhodes University, Professor Innocent Msindo. Um, our hosts, Rhodes University, we are indeed grateful um, that you've put together this um, program, this event, um, including our colleagues in the classroom, um, Dr. Corinne Knowles, who has borrowed us the title of her course. I thought I wanted to acknowledge that <laughs> for this event and the, uh, the moderator for today, Dr. Shingi Mteru, and the students at Rhodes who have provided the support, intellectual, technical um, for this event. Thank you to all our um, attendees from around the world. We see colleagues from the United States, from Europe, from across Africa, including from Nigeria, the Nigerian, um, the National Investors Commission, and people from various parts um, of the continent. We are so delighted to be here with you and to be um, having this moment to reflect on the Power Grave Handbook of African women's studies. I want to thank the contributors to the volume. Um, Dr. Magadla has introduced the volume a little bit. We actually are looking at a handbook that was published in three volumes. Um, the first volume focused on research and knowledge production on women in Africa, African women and politics, women in conflict and peace, and women and gender-based violence in Africa. Volume two focused on rewriting African women's histories, women's movements in Africa, and African women and development processes. Volume three focused on African women's creativity, arts and performance, and African women, culture and society. Of course, my, um, my virtual background is the cover for the book, for those who are curious about it, and we'll be dropping the link to the website for the book for those who want to explore it further. Um, there are two lead editors, myself and our intellectual godfather, I call him Professor Tony Falola, who it was that negotiated a series of Africa-focused handbooks with Power Grave. And it's been an immense privilege to have been a part of this 
with him and together with over 150 contributors. The colleagues who are speaking today are just a few of those who contributed 132 chapters to this volume. We are grateful to all our contributors and we are grateful to those who are speaking today. You'll hear them very soon um, for your intellectual labor. Um, I also want to use this moment to recognize um, the section editors on the handbook. And um, there were seven of them who took charge of the different sections of the book. Together, we produced this volume that was aimed at basically um, rewriting the history and the hard story of African peoples by focusing on women's existence, experiences, contributions, challenges, lives, livelihoods, and women's futures and futurities. Um, and um, not just to do that, to debunk the myths and stereotypes that have persisted over time concerning African women, both in life, in real life and in scholarship, and to as much as we could represent the diversity and intersectional identities of African women on the continent and across the globe. Um, by doing this, we aimed to transform not just the study of Africa, but our various disciplines from the various disciplines from which we write. This has been an interdisciplinary effort transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and in fact, pluridisciplinary efforts for which uh, we are grateful. I am not going to, um, to speak too much. We recommend this book to be used uh, for scholars who are interested in decolonizing their teaching, their activism, their scholarship on African women, on African studies, on the various disciplines that study Africa, and um, for all others who are interested in the subjects that are covered. I will hand the mic to um, my senior colleague, Professor Tony Falola, who has one or two words to say. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to also announce that our publishers is there. Phil from Palgrave. I, I don't know whether your schedule will let him make one or two sentences. And I want to thank our university, Gender Studies, they organized the first launching of this book, extremely successful. I want to thank King's College, University of London for organizing the second. I'm thanking Rhodes for organizing the third. And we are doing the last one in person in Nigeria. We'll be bringing many people together at a hotel and talk about the book. This has already been successful with over 250 people in attendance. We are very grateful. And we have been looking at the results of the contributors. Seven have been promoted for professor that I know. The book has been widely recognized and it has been submitted for an award organized by the African Studies Association. It is very massive. Carrying it is a lot of effort. Uh, people have complained that and you can ask the publishers why they're selling it for $600. <laughs> Maybe we we'll have to appeal to them to discount African universities so that uh, this book can fulfill its major, its major role. Rose has been at the center of studying women. The current head of the department, Shipokasi, She's a prominent figure, as well as many of you. We hope by this book to extend the conversation, the relevance, the teaching, and ultimately the centralization of women's studies in African affairs. Thank you very much.
Thank you so very much, um, Professor Falola, and thank you very much, Professor Yaku Paliso, for your introductory remarks and introducing us uh, to the book. I agree with you, uh, Prof Falola, that it would be lovely if the book became uh, more accessible so that it fulfills the purpose for which you created it to decentralize and decolonize the study of Africa. Um, and, and definitely, as uh, Dr. Magadla spoke to uh, Grace Adahosa's um, or Dr. Adahosa, contributions. It's important to ask those questions. Who do we teach? What do we teach? Who do we teach it to? And who is disadvantaged when we don't teach the things we are supposed to teach? So um, I, I second your, your recommendation and hope that uh, the editors are listening. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, it is definitely uh, my privilege and my honor um, to facilitate uh, this session for you uh, on behalf of the various departments uh, that are present this evening. My name is Dr. Shingi Mutero. I teach in the department. Um, but I was also a student of the department for many, many years. Um, as Dr. Magadda spoke, uh, she indicated that uh, we have not always uh, taught gender studies and feminism uh, at Rhodes University, and it was our honor, our privilege, but also uh, a responsibility we took very seriously to begin the journey of teaching not just feminist studies, but African feminist studies at Rhodes University. Uh, so this evening, it is my job to facilitate the, uh, the session where we will hear from the different contributors who have contributed um, various chapters to the Palgrave Handbook. Our first speaker is Professor Yolandi Buka um, and her uh, contribution and her chapter in the book was entitled Women, Colonial Resistance and Decolonization. Um, allow me to introduce her for, for, to you all this evening. Professor Booker is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Studies at Queen's University. She is a scholar practitioner of peace and conflict whose research and teaching focus on political violence, gender, decoloniality, and field research ethics in Sub-Saharan Africa. She holds a PhD in international relations from American University. Her current research is a multi-sided historical and political analysis of women combatants in South Africa. So I invite you, Professor Booker, uh, to uh, provide or to speak to your chapter. Um, I think as we discussed, each uh, contributor will have five or so minutes to speak to their chapter um, and the theme of the, the evening. Uh, the, e uh, the floor is yours, Professor. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be among you. Uh, I will actually probably take four minutes because I'm looking at the time and I want uh, the opportunity for people to ask questions and for most importantly for the students to um, offer their, their remarks on the chapter. I want to, to thank the ed editors for um, putting together this uh, edited volume. I am most importantly, as an author, want to thank them for their patience and generosity. I can only imagine the type of labor it required to gather and to patiently wait <laughs> for many chapters, including mine. Um, and um, their generosity made this chapter possible for me. And I think it's probably one of my most important contributions so far as a, as a junior scholar in the field of international relations and gender studies. So uh, their generosity, um, in fact, is, is larger than the volume that uh, Professor Falola was holding in his hands. So thank you again. So briefly, um, my discipline is international relations, but I also do a lot of work in gender studies. And one of the motivation behind this chapter was an attempt to uh, break down some of the disciplinary silos between women's studies and international relations, which is a discipline that is uh, very much uh, anchored in European and North American logics, but also in terms of scholarship and how power is understood, very much a Eurocentric. So what I was trying to do was to challenge our history, but also bring in a different type of, a different type of understanding to power in African politics domestically, but also in how African states relate to the rest of the world. So I broke the chapter in four major sections. The first section was to try to understand um, world politics as a, man world, as a man's world. 
So how do we understand the process of decolonization when we in fact understand that ascension to flag independence um, also meant in many ways accepting or being adopted into a, a community of states that was ruled by masculine perspective, perspectives of power and masculine uh, displays of power in order to organize societies and states. The second part of the, the paper uh, was an attempt to look at the diversity of the ways in which women, African women specifically, acted as agents despite the Euro European gaze. So it attempted to reconcile the fact that African states have had different types of colonial encounters. You have settler colonial states. You, in the Francophone world, you had settler colonial states in the Lusophone and Anglophone world. All of them with different types of logics, but also all of them responding to the imperatives, colonial imperatives of the, 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 colonial, um, the colonial states. More importantly, what I was trying to show in, in all its varieties was the different ways in which uh, the systems in which women operated uh, influenced the type of agency and the type of decisions they made in order to mobilize for independence, but most importantly as well, to be recognized as full humans in, in their own societies. The third section of the chapter was to bring Cynthia Enloe's interrogation of feminist curiosity and understand the different roles that women played at different stages of colonial resistance across the African continent. Now it's a tall order when you only have a few pages and what it required was in fact a survey of literature that is often ghettoized in women or African women studies literature and teasing out some of the insight and then plugging into it into uh, international relations scholarship. And in fact, what you realize when you bring all this scholarship together, in fact, I have to give a little an, an anecdote. Um, I had two research assistants help me do kind of a, a quick survey and the magnitude and the amount of scholarship that was already written on this topic was unbelievable. And in fact, one of the tasks of this volume in my view and this chapter more specifically is to normalize uh, the ways in which we read, understand, and conceptualize women's power in the post-colony. Lastly, my exhortation was to think about rewriting the birth of the, Afri the modern African state by incorporating and normalizing the presence, the power, and the strength of women in the everyday. And I will leave uh, this because I know that I've already done four minutes and I'm looking forward to the conversation to the chapter. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Buka. Yes, you are definitely on time, um, but I'm sure uh, there will be very many questions for you um, at, the, at the end of the session. So um, thank you for your contribution. We're going to move on to our second speaker. Our second speaker is Dr. Atambile Masola. Her contribution to this Palgrave handbook was entitled African Women's Letters as Decolonial Knowledge Production. Dr. Atambile Masola is a lecturer at the University of Cape Town's Department of Historical Studies. Her research is also informed by the 20th century newspaper archive in South Africa, particularly written in Isitosa. She is primarily concerned with the nature of erasure and the ways in which multiple forms of reading a variety of texts can inform archival research. Um, I'm going to invite Dr. Masola to speak to her chapter and the theme of this evening. Um, Dr. Masola, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Mtero, and thank you so much to our editors and to our hosts and to all the people who have joined us today. Um, so as Shini has said, my chapter is um, focusing on women's um, letters in the series Women Writing Africa. And I have the text here just to show, oh, well, my screen is blurry. Um, for those who don't know um, these wonderful resources, Women Writing Africa, this is from West Africa and Sahel. This is from the Northern region. And this is from the Southern region. And I chose this um, series because for me, I think it's one of the most important literary archives that we have akin to what um, Margaret Busby does with Daughters of Africa and New Daughters of Africa. 
And what you have in this literary archive is um, a treasure trove that I think uh, there's still so much opportunity for it to be mined and which is what I was trying to do by focusing on the letters that I selected from the from the, the from the four of the books um, as part of the analysis and thinking through this idea of text, but also what different kind of texts can tell us about history, about women's agency, about um, the the different kind of ways that um, texts such as letters can disrupt power relations. So the series, uh, according to all the 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 the, the, the books, when combined together, the twenty. 29 African countries represented. So there's a selection of women from as far back as the 6th century in the northern region um, all the way to the early 2000s. The first book that was published was the southern region in 2003. So you have a breadth of not only just geography in terms of um, what is represented, but also time. Um, and then the texts themselves that are represented in these um, in the series is um, you have letters, you have songs, you have novels, you have articles, you have essays, um, and so you have a range of fiction and nonfiction texts, and included in each of the um, in each of the entries. Um, is an introduction situating not only the woman who has um, who, whose text it is, and at times the, the, there isn't an, an author per se, if, if you can imagine folk songs um, are not authored by individuals but are um, created by collectives, but each text is situated. And so you also have the, the biography of each of the women represented alongside the work that they wrote. Um, and so for me, that's also very important when we're thinking about erasure, that often we don't have the names of women. And so this is also um, a, a literary archive that uses the, the tool of listing. Um, in spite of the politics of listing themselves, of course, there are people who are not included in, um, in all of these books. But the fact that we are able to compile and use what we have, for me, is a good starting point to even be able to understand the, the politics of listing, but also the importance of listing and perhaps the tension of using um, uh, listing as both a praxis um, and a methodology. Um, and so the, the letters that I then select are from a range of, 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 of regions. I select um, a letter from each of uh, the regions and a range of time. And the, the motivation behind that selection, there are many, many letters in, in, in all of these, but the, the motivation in some of the letters is that some of the letters are written um, by individuals, some of the letters are written collectively. Um, and again, this tension of how women were using texts such as letters and using letters um, as, a, as a tool for political engagement collectively and, and the effects of that for how we read women as collectives um, as opposed to kind of reading um, women's histories in silos as individuals which is often the 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 kind of the the, the ways in which we do history so um, what each of the letters also demonstrate is that the women in each of those letters were not only um, responding to very material and very um, um, kind of political issues in, in, in using letters as lobbying but they were also remaking the world. So each of the letters in, in, in using a letter to lobby for, a, for an issue, they were also reimagining the world. They were also staking a claim to the kind of world that they imagine. Um, and these letters and the responses to some of these letters um, demonstrate the, the agency in that, in that process. Um, and so, yeah, maybe I'll also pause there, Xing I don't know. Um, much time I've taken, but um, what was fascinating for me, I guess, in using Women Writing Africa, and maybe I'm, I'm belaboring this point, is even as we talk of erasure, there is still so much. So I've only kind of touched on not even 10% of each of these um, collections. And, and so when we talk about women's erasure, even as this handbook actually demonstrates, is it, it, erasure is a deliberate attempt to erase something that is already there. And it is possible to be prolific, to write a book with 
um, this many chapters with this kind of collection um, and still be ignored. So for me, erasure isn't something that happens by mistake. It's very much a political um, and and um, a political uh, and and kind of material and and um, deliberate attempt um, at using power against women's voices in particular. So I'll pause there. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Masola, for your contributions. They're very thoughtful, thought provoking, um, and, and uh, particularly within the context of our methodologies and thinking through methodologies and practice. Um, I'm sure there will be a, a many questions for you um, in the question and answer session. Um, I'm going to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Kanile Muloshwa. Um, his uh, the title for their contribution was The Subalt Subalternity of Women in African Social, Me uh, Social Movements and Politics. Um, Dr. Muloshwa undertook a PhD in Media and Cultural Studies at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Peter Maritzburg, South Africa. His research was conceptualized as a post-colonial and decolonial critique of intersections of the media, migration, and the urban in representations of black subjectivity in post-apartheid South Africa. Committed to a decolonial humanities, he experiments with transdisciplinary approaches in urban migration, border, media, and cultural studies. He has published work in peer-reviewed journals and edited books. I'm going to hand over the floor to Dr. Muloshwa to speak to his chapter and the theme of the evening. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Shingemtero. I think as a way of starting, I'll say, working as a journalist for 10 years in Zimbabwe, Southern region, I observed problematic ways in which the media and society treated women in general, in politicians or those who hold positions of power in particular. In the journalistic imagination, it was as if it is impossible to give women independence, even symbolic independence. A woman never stood on their own, such that a powerful woman, for example, the vice president of the country, Joyce Mjuru, was spoken about as Mrs. Mjuru, suggesting that her power lies in her husband. The husband was always referred to as the kingmaker in Zanu PF in this map in politics. The media and other societal institutions as a patriarchal infrastructure of representation almost always undermines women's political agents. A woman political leader is always represented as lacking any political agenda and is always fronting for some male or males. In my chapter contribution to this book, the Handbook of African Women's Studies, I attempt to discuss this symbolic annihilation especially in the case of Dr. Nkosazana Lamini Zuma, who some people have referred to as a friend for her former husband, Jacob Zuma. I sought to reveal the absurdity of such a view in the case of female students in the fees must fall case. The, female, the fees must fall, female students revealed or they sort of enacted a feminist politics agency that questioned their, their male counterparts within the movement such that no one could blame them of being a friend of anyone, least their male, their male colleagues. As for Queen Los Gay, Lolo, and Mbuya Nehanda, while the idea that they are a friend for males is there, what is important is that their case reveals how long, in a historical sense, the undermining of women's political agents has been ongoing. In the present, I mean, their case is also, it also re reveals that in the present, even the work in political agents of women who have passed on is still undermined. In my chapter contribution, when from a decolonial perspective, I argue that in the post-colonial moment, women in African politics continue to be sidelined and marginalized since the political space is structured by patriarchy, which encourages a masculinist politics. I use archival and historical research in analyzing the subalternization of women in African politics, trying to historicize patriarchy, the representation of women and the struggles of, in terms of feminist politics. I use the concept of the subaltern, the way Spivak conceptualizes it, to refer to the lack of voice 
such that subalterns cannot speak for themselves. I know this is debatable and the concept itself is criticized. I believe that Zimbabwe's, Zimbabwe's anti-colonial heroines, that is Queen Lose Gay and Prophetess Nehanda, and even Kosazana Damini Zuma of the ANC, and especially the Fees Must Fall women, have a voice. They have or had political agents. However, patriarchy has over the years constantly and consistently sought to undermine their political agents, to silence them and render them a subaltern group. They are being rendered or they are being silenced even as they speak. I thank you. I think I'll stop here. Thank you so very much, Dr. Mlochwa. I think um, I resonate a lot with what, what you have, have said, and I'm, I'm interested to, to hear the questions that come from the floor, particularly within the context uh, of the fees must fall. And I'm sure you're aware of uh, the politics uh, surrounding student protests um, uh, uh, in our campuses. So I'm interested to hear from the students your, their, their thoughts on, on your contribution. Um, I'm going to move on to the next speaker. Um, it is my pleasure um, and my honor to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Zetu Matabani. Um, her contribution to uh, the book was entitled The State of LGBT Rights in Africa. Professor Zetu Matabani holds the NRF Sachi Chair in Sexualities, Genders and Queer Studies at the University of Fort Hare, a sociologist, queer activist, and writer. Professor Matabeni has previously held positions at the University of Cape Town and the University of Pretoria. Her work focuses on African queer studies. Um, Professor Matabeni, the floor is yours. Um, welcome. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amtero. Um, thank you, Shingi, for that introduction. Um, first, I'd like to say uh, uh, congratulations to um, the editors, Professor Ola Jakob Haliso and um, and, and Professor, uh, <coughs> sorry, and Professor Falola. Um, it's it's really a, um, a great pleasure to, um, firstly, to have been invited to contribute a piece uh, to this collection and, and also just to see the magnitude of it. Um, uh, so I was asked to, um, to write a piece on, um, uh, as Shingi said, the state of LGBTQI rights in, in Africa. Um, and I must admit, uh, I, initially, I, I, I wondered um, how how would this actually uh, feature in in a handbook on African women's studies? Um, and I I thought, well, that's not for me to debate. The editors know why they asked me to write it, so <laughs> I will just offer what I um, what I wanted to say. Uh, and it was a great pleasure actually to write this piece. And and I want to thank again the editors for their editorial work, which I found. Um, uh, very supportive. Uh, it was great to work with um, with editors who who really didn't um, tell you how to represent your ideas or thoughts. So thank you for that. Um, so the chapter, um, the state of LGBT rights in Africa, is in two parts, and the first discusses the status of um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights in Africa or in African countries using a human rights frame, and the second part pays particular attention to religion law, family, popular culture, media, and health, and how these aspects have impacted um, LGBT, LGBT people's lives in the continent. So it starts off by unpacking the human rights frame uh, using um, um, uh, what, we, what I, I called uh, the continuum of seven stages from total marginalization to cultural integration. Um, in the chapter, I offer a view of where African countries find themselves in this continuum and present the challenges that inhibit the progression to cultural integration. So it appears from this serving of the landscape that colonization still has a firm hold on how sexuality and gender remain viewed and criminalized in the continent. And I quote from the chapter, Vibrant LGBT activism in the global South is evidence of the urgency needed to challenge the laws that were created and imposed by the West. More solidarity and alliance within the global South, as in the case with India and Kenya, demonstrates hope in tackling colonial laws through local means. It cannot be that the West 
will dictate how and when these laws should be done away with. So there's a need to remain locally and culturally relevant in pursuit of LGBT rights in Africa. And this over-reliance on and sometimes replication of Western ways does not often do justice to LGBT persons in African context, close quotes. So with regards to religion, which is one of the aspects that I look at, uh, many scholars link homophobia in Africa with religious um, proselytization, colon, um, colonialism, law, and nationalism. There is a, an intimate connection between anti-homosexuality and religion because the misconception that homosexuality is un-African is similarly applied to homosexuality being un-Christian. And we now understand how the colonial project was deeply linked to Christian missions. And so it is no surprise that anything considered against the norm in terms of sexuality and gender would be considered ungodly. And similarly, understanding family in post-colonial African societies, we see how colonial laws govern family formations on who belongs and on what grounds. And both the law and religion play significant roles in families and their relations to LGBT members. But this is not without resistance. And this is perhaps where the chapter makes significant contributions about the forms of activism and resistant, resistance that has taken place in the continent in, in relation to LGBT inclusion. Uh, <clears throat> The, the chapter mentions different interventions made by religious groups in parts of the continent to um, reinterpret scripture for the inclusion of LGBT rights or LGBT persons, the new and um, alternate forms of making family and belonging that LGBT uh, persons themselves are creating, the kinds of representations that are championed by LGBT persons to reframe images of themselves in the media and popular culture as well as fighting for access to healthcare. So all of this, um, yeah, you can read in the chapter. So LGBT people in Africa face many human rights challenges and many of these challenges uh, cannot be overcome while LGBT people remain illegal and criminalized. And um, while not all countries in Africa may enter, may even enter the stage of or what many people um, um, want to look at as cultural integration, LGBT persons in many countries are forging their own ways of pushing against norms and expanding on ideas around sexuality, gender, belonging, nationhood, and citizenship. Um, so while the human rights frame remains important, it, has also, it also has to make space for a vision of what I call the queer future, which is still unfolding in the African continent. And um, perhaps what is more crucial at the moment is the pursuit of each and every lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender person or intersex and queer to be uh, considered in terms of their full humanness. So in a nutshell, that's what the chapter is about. And I look forward to your feedback and comments, students. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Matabeni, uh, for your contribution and speaking to your chapter. Um, I, I, I have seen some of my students have already prepared questions for you, so um, I'm, I'm excited to hear uh, their, their, your responses to them. Um, I'm going to move on to our next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Divya Bana. Her contribution to the chapter was entitled Girls, Sexuality Between Agency and Vulnerability. Professor Divya Bana is the South African Research Chair, Sachi Chair in Gender and Childhood Sexuality at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She is the author and editor of 11 books. Her latest authored book is entitled Girls' Negotiation of Porn in South Africa, Power, Play and Sexuality. Um, I invite you, Professor Divya, to the floor. Um, please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the editors um, for their uh, sterling work on, uh, on this book and really necessary um, for this continent. I also would like to thank the organizers and the, um, the, 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 the attendees. Um, I think this is really um, an important space in which we could spread the word about um, gender and sexuality. Uh, on the continent. I am very aware that we have a diverse um, group of, um, uh, of, of attendees. And so I would like to begin by reflecting upon a newspaper article that um, I came across yesterday 
in uh, a local um, uh, a, a, a local newspaper referring to a group uh, of girls from a high school in um, from a from a um, from a, a township setting close to Durban that had gathered outside a magistrate's court where a teacher is, was expected to appear on alleged rape charges. And so the girls who are all clad in full school uniform, they were carrying placards calling for the teacher to be denied bail. And this picket follows the arrest of the, the, their school teacher who is accused of sexually harassing several girls. He would take their cell phones and ask them to come to his home to collect it. And the pupils were singing revolutionary songs with the suspect's photograph pasted on the placards with the words in Isi Zulu, Sekwanele Manje, which translates to enough is enough. So I want to begin with that concrete description of what this chapter seeks to do. And what this snippet from the news allows me to do is to present to you directly the question of girls' sexuality and vulnerability, but also their agency. And so the, the, the punchline um, in which I take a cue from Bakari Yusuf's work is that, uh, who, in terms of her work with African women, is that we need, that I make a case for extending African feminist thought about what sexuality means in the lives of younger women and girls in particular, in the context of vulnerability and agency. Now, referring back to that newspaper snippet, it has become very clear that there's only one side of the coin that has been reflected in the dominant research um, and understanding of girls on the continent. And that is of one uh, based on, um, uh, on vulnerability, on passivity and victimization. Now, even in the context where policy and programming um, is celebrating uh, girl power. When it comes to sexuality, girls are seen uniformly or mainly as victims of male violence, as we have seen in this newspaper snippet. And so the chapter provides a more critical analysis of girls' agency, showing how they both navigate the treacherous conditions, structural inequalities, but also the need for a review of methodological and theoretical framing that allows us to have a far more sophisticated analysis of girls' sexuality beyond an exclusive framing on victimization. The next part of this five minute talk will focus on, you know, there are several gaps in our knowledge about girls' sexuality. And these uh, gaps include, not comprehensive, but include uh, the lack of attention to girls' sexual desires and pleasures, as well as girls' sexuality in non-heterosexual relationships. Uh, there is then, and I refer back to the punchline, a need for African feminist thought to address girls and younger girls specifically by focusing on their lived experiences, their everyday nuances and the possibilities. And so whilst this um, gap is, will, uh, resonates across the globe, in much of Africa, the ideas that we have about girls and younger femininity is also rooted in historical processes and of course, colonial logics. So the, one of the major arguments that I am making is that if we continue to see girls as simply passive and help, helpless victims of sexuality, we fail to understand how girls are indeed, and I refer back to the newspaper uh, a snippet, how girls are 
engaging in activist movements, how girls are engaging as referring back to the, 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 the newspaper snippet in songs and dance, in placard raising, in resisting. And we need to be much more sensitive to how girls' agency is caught up in the nexus between agency and vulnerability. Um, so the chap, what does then does a chapter do? It then seeks to dislodge the dominant view of girls as solely victims of sexuality, but it also seeks to theorize how we might think about girls, age, gender, and sexuality in ways that take heed of the broader political so and sociocultural context. And when childhood is viewed only, and girls in particular, in the context of vulnerability and needing rescuing from sexuality, we only have a partial view of um, a girl's uh, sexuality and agency. The, ch the chapter suggests further that um, we fail to address the dynamic ways through which sexuality is produced. Indeed, we silence it and we create further danger by ignoring how girls' own voices tell us more about how they experience sexuality beyond danger and how they act and resist and are indeed active agents, referring back to the newspaper snippet, um, in terms of developing um, their own capacities uh, to, to um, uh, contest the, the current status quo. Um, and then I, um, I uh, argue for addressing the rich and complex uh, ways in which girls navigate their everyday lives. And instead of being handicapped as we are currently, by the sterile dichotomies which continue to position younger girls as, as suffering from sexuality and uh, helpless. And so in the final 30 seconds, I want to argue uh, further that these, the ways in which girls have been shaped on the continent in terms of sexuality reflect the continu continuing legacy and incalcitrant colonial logics that produces a certain foreclosure in understanding um, uh, uh, girls' sexuality and femininity. And of course, a fundamental misrecognition of their agency um, in, in uh, uh, the misrecognition of their agency and a prioritization of their vulnerability. So the chapter makes one thing very clear. Despite the potential for uh, the, the, the widespread activist, activist movements, the decolonial projects and the vibrancy in women and gender studies, a focus on younger girls remains a marginal concern in women and gender studies. And I'm arguing that it is about time that the, gen the genesis on which the legacy of this is based is indeed uh, an important project to decolonize and indeed to, to engage with girls' own activist stances and to do so in ways that allow us to document their lives in terms of what is really happening and to support allyship in engendering the social and uh, the gender justice and sexual justice project. Thank you. Um, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Bana, for your contribution and speaking to your chapter. I think you have provoked many of us as far as um, the the sites of 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 research and interest that um, we 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 look to when we're thinking about gender studies and decolonizing gender studies. Um, I I think. Uh, 
probably in attendance, Kogolondi where Mtambo did a study for her masters on uh, Zulu girlhood and the process of Umemulo. And I think that sort of work speaks to this theme that we're going over this, this evening about around pedagogy and who we study and why we study and then therefore um, what we teach about and who we teach it to. Um, thank you so very much for your contribution. Um, I'm going to move on to our last speaker. I just need to double check that she is in attendance. Our last speaker is meant to be Professor Adejumo. Uh, Professor, are you in attendance? Um, it looks like she may not be in attendance. If she does pop in towards the end of uh, the session, we will give her some time to speak to her chapter. Um, but for the purposes of time, um, we will continue. I'd just like to thank you all. Thank you to all the, the contributors, to the scholars who have spoken to... Um, okay, her hand up is in the chat. Um, Dr. Magadla, is it possible for you to, as the host, to look if there's a way to um, switch her over onto uh, as a panelist? Because the, if she is present, um, she has likely been put into the participants category. While I wait on Dr. Magadla, is that possible? Oh, there we go. Great. Um, good evening, uh, Professor Adejumo. Um, let me just do uh your introduction and and hand over the floor to you um professor adejumo is a faculty member of the institute uh, for entrepreneurship and development studies at obafemi Alol alolowo university nigeria uh, professor adejumo holds a doctorate in economics and she is a research fellow at the center for economic policy and development research Covenant University. Uh, her research interests intersect development issues, including entrepreneurship, labor, human capital development, gender, and sustainability issues. Um, her chapter in the handbook was entitled Gender Budgeting in Africa. Uh, Professor Adejumo, the floor is yours. Um, you're more than welcome. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ntaro. Um, basically, um, I want to stand on existing protocols because of the time. I contributed, like uh, Dr. Otero observed, gender budget in Africa. And um, the chapter was disintegrated into four major areas, which has to do with the major, nature of gender budgeting, the dimensions of gender budgeting in Africa, and mechanisms for utilizing gender budgets in Africa, as well as um, the utilization of gender budgeting for gender equality in Africa. With regards to the nature of gender budgeting, gender budgeting basically has to do with um, um, the sensitivity of budgets at whatever level into um, the, the sensitivity of budgets at whatever level into, uh, by, by, by noting the importance of genders, but whether man or woman, whether male or female. And before I continue, I want to take a clue from the governor's um, statement, who was a, parliament, a parliamentarian in the South African um, house. He mentioned and noted that any country, if you want to know the direction a country is headed, you look at its budgets, its national budget, in, and resource allocation in terms of women and children. 
So um, gender budgets in Africa started basically in um, South Africa and other countries like um, Uganda, um, Mozambique, Tanzania, Botswana, Nigeria have also embraced these budgets. But the, the challenge I have with um, the fact that these countries are embracing gen um, the, the, the prejudice of budgeting as regards gender and the fact that development outcomes still lag behind in numerous dimensions is what necessitated this chapter. And um, looking at gender budgets, like I said, the nature is such that you have two different, you have myriads of dimensions, but basically we have the um, sensitive budgets to gender and the insensitive budgets. The insensitive budget is the regular budgets that we have that do not take into the, um, the, um, consideration the peculiarities of gender, whether male or female. And um, some of the um, gender budgets that I've looked at or the dimensions of gender budgets I've looked at, it is discovered that some of this uh, budget actually require being skewed or prejudiced in terms of um, particular policies as to how resource allocation and utilization affects men and women differently in different spaces. Given the policy that a particular government want to implement at time. The dimensions of gender budget, which I observed, are in various categories. We have the class-based budget um, policy and we have the status-based policy, where you have um, the, the class-based policy is such that um, the, the, the sex roles drive the budget, um, the, the, the design of the gender budget. Whereas in the status-based policy, just like South Africa does, is this, it, it, it's the um, capacity of either gender or the aim of the policy that drives the, um, the, the, sen the sensitivity of the budget. For instance, if you want to increase the capacity of women to engage in labor spaces, the budget will be skewed towards that purpose. Um, I, for the purpose of time, I just observed some, there are other um, nitty gritties in the, budget, in, in the book, but I just observed some of the challenges and the importance of um, gender-based um, budgeting in Africa. In, um, some of the um, challenges, <laughs> the challenges of gender budgeting in Africa includes um, the challenge of materials, men, and um, mechanisms for actually going through the process of adopting gender budgeting in Africa. For instance, the systematic implementation of policies is a challenge in Africa based on some of the um, evidences that exist. These are just uh, inferences from them. We have the unrealistic figures of, um, gender, uh, or, 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 of um, data in Africa, then the endemic nature of patriarchism and um, the corruption. And also we have the challenge of low level of income where gender budgeting may not be an issue or may not be um, of interest to some governments or some systems. And then we have the challenge of manpower, like I mentioned before. But if this um, budget is to be adopted in Africa, it can help to mitigate um, the challenge of inequality in the sense that it can also um, help in a data-driven economy if the, the government can, or the whatever constituted authority that decides to adopt it, they, it can help to reduce the challenge of um, the, the challenge of um, in, in, in interven intervening in particular areas that requires need, identifying areas of need and intervening in those specific areas. Then it can help to reduce the challenge of gender gaps and also 
promotes inclusive governance, advocacy, and it's got the, the, the gender um, budget can serve as advocacy document and even a bargaining document for planning and how it can help in reducing inequality is such that there's the dimension of gender budgeting that has to do with um, or within policy and or without policy where the government may sit and say okay this is what we want to do and then they decide okay this is how we want to be and give report based on that purpose and also they can also evolve the without policy where they involve both the uh, people the private sector the ngos and every other um um stakeholder as it were and then they evolve a partnership to gender budgeting as it were then they can uh, to reduce inequality also they can um, mainstream gen gender goals. They can, mainstream, they can mainstream gender goals into governance structure, such that by adopting the bottom-up approach, the social contract um, policy of the government and the people is strengthened through these approaches. Um, there are other dimensions in the book or, or approaches in the book that. Um, that um, the, the gender budgeting um, mechanism can help with if governments and other um, constituted authority can be painstaking enough to um, go through the process to, to, to use it to ensure gender mainstreaming, reducing um, gender inequality and um, reducing discrimination amongst male and female as it were. Thank you. Um, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Adejumu, for your, your contribution. Um, I am going to move over on the program to the section for the student discussants. Um, we have two student discussants who are going to speak uh, to us in response uh, to the chapters that uh, have been spoken to by the various authors uh, this evening. Um, the student respondents, um, are Nompumelelo Babeli and Shikomborero Mazia Nanga. Um, first, we're going to have Nompumelelo uh, speak to several of the chapters. Um, I'm going to introduce her to you this evening. Nompumelelo Queen Babeli holds a triple major bachelor's degree and an honors degree from Rhodes University. She is currently a master's candidate at the Department of Political and International Studies at Rhodes University. Nompumelelo is passionate about magnifying the role of women in society. Um, Mpumi, if you are ready, the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Evening, yeah. Um, my name is Nopumanelo Babeli. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Matero. Um, yeah, so I had the privilege of reading Professor Obama's um, reading and Dr. Masola and Prof. Matebeni. Um, and it's true what the editor said in the beginning of the book that this collection brings the previously marginalized um, stories and her stories to relief in centering these stories in the disciplinary studies of various aspects of Africa, um, and that ultimately rewriting the history of African people and society and these histories will provide a more complete and accurate account. So I have a lot of comments, but I have some questions here and there. So if um, Prof. Bana, uh, Dr. Masola, and Prof. Matewene can just write them down and just respond much later. But if you want me to repeat, that'll be fine. There's more comments than questions. So I'm going to start with Dr. Masola. Um, so on your paper on women's letters and intellectual history and decol the decolonial um, knowledge production, you speak about the idea of finding new avenues of knowing. Um, and you do um, say in the paper that the letters that you speak to um, raise questions on how the archive is conceptualized and whether it is always about choosing the texts um, in the archive rather than looking closely at other spaces like oral literature, songs and folklore, um, folktale, sorry, and letters, uh, which will enrich our understanding of human um, spaces. Now, as someone who did her research and went to the archive, I wanted to ask you, um, 
but how do we make sense of the fact that state has ownership over certain archives and how do we negotiate our way around that to complete the picture to provide further accounts of our history given that you have certain archives and UCT or roads that are embargoed that we can't access and majority of those also contain women's voices. So that's for you. And to Prof Barna and Prof Matebeni, this is a bit tricky. Um, given the fact that there were, I'm gonna, I think mine are mostly comments for both of you, uh, but I pose this to both of you given that there's so many overlaps in both your readings. Um, so both of you, um, so both of you and your readings on girls and LGBT um, occupy the same position. So how do we make sense of the fact that um, the LGBT and girls occupy the same position of vulnerability, but from different locations, right? Uh, with the idea of Africanness. So for girls, like their sort of authenticity comes from whether they're virgins or submissive and the use of contraceptive, which Dr. Minprof Barnard has, discusses in the reading. And for the LGBT, their vulnerability, which is just being who they are and being able to access certain rights is seen as inauthenticity, right? So closely linked to the idea of them being an African. So both groups are suffering between the link of inauthenticity and vulnerability and its proximity to the notion of Africanness. So if you could just speak to that. Uh, but also on another hand, both of you talk about, um, so to, Prof, um, Prof Bona, you speak about the idea of girl like protection sort of in the reading and girls being protected. And uh, Dr. Mate, uh, Prof Matebeni, you speak about um, the LGBT being protected through anus checking, protection from the waste, um, conversion therapy. And so this reminded me of the myth of protection by um, Tikna and how basically um, the idea of protection to protect vulnerable bodies, right? But then how do we make sense of the myth of protection in both cases with regards to the state, given that both of you saw an overlap in health, state, religious, and media and law, and how that takes away agency from both groups. And so there is no protection in this regard, given that both groups occupy a majority of the casualties within this statehood that we find ourselves in. And lastly, because there were so many overlaps, I'm very interested to hear how um, you guys think that these areas of scholarship can actually work together in coming up with solutions with regards to all these institutions like health, because I think Prof. Matebeni, you do speak about how the LGBT um, don't have access to things like health, and even in situations when they do, um, you listed um, 31 countries and you use the seven, I have to just share my thoughts, sorry. You use the um, seven legal protection pre uh, presented by Kurds, and you speak about how 31 African countries still deem um, um, homosexuality is illegal and 22 um, have moved to making it legal, but five of them only guarantee rights to protect the LGBT and only one of them has given them rights, I mean, positive rights and full legal, um, full legal um, status. And then, but none of them have actually moved to the seventh, um, to the seventh one, which you call the cultural integration, right? So how do we then make that happen? But also how can the possibility of combining the scholarship work? So my conclusion um, is that all these readings indicate a sense of agency being granted and that under, um, understanding that women, LGBT and girls can exercise their agency and have done so for long, but I mean for long, but the institutions and system deny them the right to stand firm um, in the center, given the notions of this Africanness, which all the readings point out to, and that all three readings make us question um, the legacy of colonialism, as Dr. Masola um, says in her contribution that the big white men of history were replaced with the big uh, black men of history whose concerns of emancipation and race have silenced the question of gender and may I add of sexuality in this case. Thank you.
Thank you so much, um, Mpumi. Thank you for your excellent interventions and your engagement uh, with the work. I think it's so important to highlight that it's important as far as our pedagogy is concerned, not just at the, at the department, but, uh, but at the university to, to take this opportunity to learn with and together with our students. So it's really important to hear back from them how they think through the work that we're doing. Um, I'm going to hand over to the next uh, student discussant who is uh, Shikum Borero. Um, I'm just going to read his introduction here for you uh, now. Shikum Borero Mazia Nanga completed an undergraduate uh, in BA Political Science and Law in 2019 and an Honours in Political Science with Distinction in 2020. Shiko received academic honours as well. He is currently studying for his Master's in Politics at Rhodes University. He is part of the local organising committee for the 15th Biennial South African Association for Political Studies 2021. He is also a student tutor at St Andrews College where he coaches hockey and cricket. Uh, I'm going to hand over the floor to Shikom Borero. And after he speaks, I'll give an opportunity for all of um, our contributors and speakers this evening to respond to the questions that have been posed uh, by our discussants. Uh, Shikom, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Dr. Mateo. Um, so I'll start with uh, Professor Booker's chapter, and then I'll move to Dr. Loshwa's chapter, and then I'll move to Dr. Adejumo's chapter. But, but then in my comments, uh, I'll also outline that these are the questions for the comments. So I think um, for Professor Booker's chapter, uh, I think the paper clearly outlines that the absence of women from mainstream historical and political landscapes is due to African African political scholarships stub on lack of systemic consideration and investigation of women as agents in their own right throughout history. So I think Professor Booker outlines the erasure of women from narratives about the emergence of the modern African state. So this is something that we see every day, but we never think of it. So I do not think women, you know, uh, feature when we talk about the theory of Pan-Africanism or uh, developments on the post up post colonial state, because even in nationalist historiography, as mentioned by Boka, for instance, authors such as Masrui and Walter Rodney, they barely mention the interests of women. So importantly, Boka shows that uh, our writing about anti colonial efforts is based on the elite, with men as the primary actors. So Booker's chapter impressively shows that there is an abundance of scholarship on African women's contribution on anti-colonial resistance, but women are still absent from mainstream analysis. So this raises questions on what needs to be done. So this is my first question to Professor Bukas. So how do we change this and what has contributed to this? What I mean is that what has contributed to us having an abundance of scholarship on African women's contribution to anti-colonial resistance, but we still see that women are absent from mainstream analysis. So there's this invisibilization of women that the chapter addresses. And you know, we see that some women, there are no names when it talks about their accounts. So Booker raises this idea of how the state is understood, written about, or analyzed in masculine and militarized forms of power, which erases women their interests, presence, and agency in public politics. Booker gives a rich understanding of context on the role of women and their positions from power, starting from the women in Dahomey to the women in South Africa, from the combatants to the non-combatants. So my next question is, how can we understand, write, or analyze the state in ways that do not focus on masculine and militarized forms of power? So moving on to Dr. Mlosho's chapter on the subalternity of women in social movements and African politics. There was a crossover between the two chapters, which I thought was impressive um, because they clearly outlined the issues that are being faced by women. So we see that with Dr. Blocho's chapter, it addresses and raises some of the things that are raised by Professor Booker. You know, there's a connection definitely between the two chapters. So by subalternity, this is the condition where a social group 
in this regard, women is removed from all lines of social mobility and legs agency. So we see that Professor Mlocho explains um, that men stand in for women in political spaces in Africa, as symbolic and material. And there's, there's evidence, or um, Mlocho gives an example of the church. So Mlocho raises the argument of subordination of women in African politics under the capitalist a neoliberal patriarchy of the colonial and post-colonial movement. I thought this wasn't really clear. And do you mind, Dr. Mnocha, to just explain this, uh, the subordination of women, of women in African politics under the capitalist and neoliberal patriarchy of the colonial and post-colonial movement. So do you mind just explaining what it is and how it works? And there's this idea that you raise as well. So why do women come short of seizing power and influencing the direction that their com communities and nations take? So you use the Nkosazana Lamini Zuma and in your presentation, you also mentioned um, uh, former Vice President of Zimbabwe, Joyce Mujuru. So, so do you also mind explaining, this is another question, why do women always come short of seizing and influencing power and the direction that their communities take um, in in the post-colonial African state. So we see that um, Mlochwa also encourages us to think about the idea of patriarchy and how it is fluid and has taken different forms and formats. So Mlochwa describes patriarchy as the rule of society by the brotherhood of males. And we see that throughout Africa as well. So this is interesting because we see this brotherhood of males everywhere. And most importantly, what was interesting is that he manages to visibilize uh, what I thought was a brilliant take, Queen Lozikei of the Ndebele Kingdom, who I think has been forgotten in historical accounts. And he also manages to, to bring out Mbuya Nehanda, a spirit medium, who led the Shona people in their war of Chimorengo, or war of liberation. Lastly, Mlochwa shows the linkages between corruption political violence and electoral theft to the patriarchal nature of politics. I thought this was a brilliant take, but my question is similar to the question um, that I raised to for Professor Book. Can you construct the way we understand power in the nation state to one that is not patriarchal? Um, yeah, uh, that, that was, I think, a gap in the literature. So do you mind just answering that as well? So moving on to, lastly, to uh, Dr. Adijuma, chapter on gender budgeting in Africa. So gender budgeting in Africa, she describes it, uh, means preparing budgets or analyzing them for gender perspective. So gender budgeting, she argues, checks inequalities and sets the equalization of the status of women through resource availability and civic rights to facilitate better access to services funded by the government. So. Uh, Dr. Dijumo acknowledges the role of African governments have tried through gender budgets, but uh, do you mind just uh, explaining, because I thought there was also a gap on the level of commitment the African governments have tried on gender budgets. Moving on, um, because yeah, this was not clearly addressed, um, Adijumo also outlined that there are policies throughout Africa that facilitate gender budgets and gender mainstreaming, so there is reference in the chapter about gender budgeting commitment from African states. For instance, the Rural Women of Nigeria, 1987, Women, United Women's Organization, among many others. So uh, another question is, what is the position on gender budgeting currently in Africa? Um, and can we measure the progress from where it started and where it is now? So Adijumo brilliantly, brilliantly raises something that has always ended progress in Africa. And she also, she also mentioned it in a presentation where she outlined that the main challenge with most African economies is not the knowledge or applicability of gender budgets, but being able to match this gender consideration, consideration in gender budgeting in de with development concerns. So how do we do this? How do we address this um, for African states where there's this demand for development and there's also this demand for gender budgeting. How do we address this? So uh, Adijumo also used South Africa as a case study and outlined different approaches for gender budgeting as she outlined in the presentation. 
So the most critical thing that was raised about gender budget is the need is that how the needs for men and women are effectively considered for and appropriately catered for via resource allocation. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Shriko. Uh, thank you for your questions. Maybe uh, you and uh, Pumi White might want to keep your cameras on while the, um, uh, while the contributors um, speak to uh, your questions just for clarity. Um, I'm going to start off with um, Bumi's uh, 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 contributions. And I think your first question was to Dr. Masola. Um, so uh, Dr. Masola, please feel free uh, to respond to her questions. Thanks. Um, thanks, Dr. Jera, and thanks Nafumalela for your question. And thanks for asking such a difficult question. Um, and for, you know, for the sake of time, I think it's an ongoing conversation. Um, and I think one of the things we take for granted when we talk about the archive is we think of something as that is sitting there waiting for us. Um, and, and I would love to do like ongoing just conversations about methodology in relation to the archive, because I think what you're asking is this question of what do we do when we get to the archive? And how do we access the archive, even those of us who are in these institutions that by and large give us an open door to some of these institutions, we ourselves face um, a lack of access. And one of the things I'm learning is a relentlessness with the archive and an intuitiveness. I think one of the things we don't talk about when it comes to research is how you have to be intuitive in relation to when you're going to the archive because you're not going to something that is set and ready waiting to be made sense by you is that you have to sit there and you make sense of something. You form the story. So on the one hand, it has to be a relentlessness. Is that something that we have to do over and over and over again? And a level of consistency. Um, and in terms of the, the embargoed um, archive that you're referring to, it's about lobbying. I think we take for granted the ways in which we can lobby, especially lobby collectively, in order to, to get access to, to some of that work. Um, and, and with this question of consistency, um, one of the things um, a friend and I often talk about is um, their experience of going to the archive is that every time they can go to the same archive and ask in a very open and kind of general sense, I'm looking for information on X. And every time they will get something different. So it's not that the archive is even the people, so there's also the power of the people who hold the archive, the custodians of the archives and the way in which we relate to them and the questions that we ask when we go to that archive. So um, I think it's a, it's a, not a one-off thing. Um, I think it's uh, for people who are doing this kind of scholarship, it's an over and over and over and over again until you decide to pivot um, and leave that work behind. And then the, the, the ethics of what you then make accessible. Um, here at UCT, there is a project called the 500 Year Archive, and they started digitizing some of the archives that have been either made difficult to get hold of or kind of in the, in the public interest of making some of these works um, available. So there are a variety of methods, but for me, the number one is just a collective practice of revisiting the archive over and over again. I think that was the key question. I'll pause there for now. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Masula. I think the next two questions were, I think, in tandem for both Professor Bana and, and Professor Matabani. I don't know who would prefer to go first, but um, I can see your camera is on Professor Matabani. So if you'd like to, to go first. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Shibi. Uh, let me first thank uh, Nobumalelo for, for, for that reading of, um, of that chapter. And I really appreciated that you found, uh, you read it alongside uh, Divya's uh, piece and you found these commonalities. And <clears throat> um, your question is a very tricky one because you, you are um, definitely picking up the complexity of um, what it means to be an LGBT person in the continent. And it is both, uh, as, you, as you pick up this you know, existing with the duality of um, uh, having the myth of protection, as you call it, and also um, being simultaneously um, made vulnerable. And, and, and it is, I mean, the vulnerability part is, 
uh, and I, I, I know people would argue against what I'm about to say. The vulnerability is also um, created by, um, by this category, LGBT. Um, and it is, it is a category that comes into, in, into the continent from elsewhere. Um, and I say this because um, we've had, uh, I mean, now we know we've had forms of existence, gender and, and sexual diversity that has been in the continent that were not necessarily considered LGBT, but the moment LGBT gets into, um, um, into our frame, then it, 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 it brings about these ideas that certain people have to be legislated against and certain people have to be protected because of what they represent or who they are, et cetera. So there is that slippery ground where, you know, you, um, you, you create a category for yourself that, that makes you vulnerable, but you're also using it so that you can claim certain rights. But at the same time, these rights are not, uh, you know, they, they're, they're not rights that can actually really give you a sense of, of being fully human because you can only be seen under the gaze of you know this idea of legality of human rights so they, i mean it, it is a it is a very complex it, it is a very complex issue um yeah and and i think yeah you've picked you've picked up um you've picked it up nicely so let me let me let me let divya respond to the other question okay thank you prof um professor bana the floor is yours um, thanks very much. Um, I have to um, reaffirm the really clever uh, questions that have been raised, and I, and I want to commend the student um, for the, for the sort of questions that you have showed. Your audio has a lot of interruption. Uh, we can't really hear you. I'm not sure if you've changed your setting. Hear me now? Can you hear me now? We can hear you, but there's uh, like a static as you're speaking. So I have uh, no idea what's going on. Um, can you hear me now? Um, we can hear you, but the, 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 there continues to be like a, a lot of static, so you can hardly... Like, Should I disconnect? Um, Should I disconnect? Yeah, sure. That's fine. That's fine. That's okay. Okay. Um, so while we wait uh, uh, for Professor Bana to reconnect, um, I'm going to ask, um, I think Shriko's first questions were to Professor Buka. Um, so Professor Buka, um, there we go. Um, thank you very much, Shiko, for this reading of my paper and for um, kind of teasing out some of the main, main questions um, with regards to erasure and how women are made invisible in, in, in the understanding of the making of the, the post-colonial state, but also just the making of African societies in general. Um, and, and it's a good question. I think part of it has to do with who holds power, um, and who gets to write history. The same way in which the majority of people who are in universities or who are living around this world actually don't understand the extent to which Africans participated in World War II, for instance. Over a million African individuals from across various Black, and actually Black individuals from across the diaspora and the African continent participating, actively participated in World War II. These people are completely erased from, from, from international memory. You see very similar uh, mechanisms through which women are erased. Part of it has to do with something that I mentioned in, in, the, in the chapter, which is you know, how does the modern, and here I'm talking about modernity and the enlightenment, the post-enlightenment world, how does that world um, become organized in a gendered way? And this very international gender, and here I'm, you know, there's a, this distinction between when we're talking about the wo women's inclusion and gendered power, how particular types of power and particular types of, 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 um, of, of displays of power are prioritized in a, in a, in a hierarchy that minimi mi minimizes the everyday 
and minimizes particular types of manifestation of authority or legitimacy. Um, and if we understand this kind of the way this international organization of nations and states and power is also manifested in the post-colonial uh, state, here, keeping in mind the ways in which, as was mentioned before, the way the colonial encounter transformed gender roles, gender expectations, gender identities, and so on and so forth, we understand that hooking into this international system um, also prioritize particular types of individual, men of a of particular class into the making of the, the narrative of the post-colony. And there's an, a deliberate, in my view, a deliberate erasure um, of people who contributed intellectually, who contributed symbolically, who contributed uh, intellectually uh, through writing, through songs, through slogans, through the collecting of funds to support the independence movement. So, you know, what contributes to this er erasure is who gets to write history and who checks them. Yeah. And I think we're arriving at a moment where we want to check these powers, whether they are writing in the academy or outside of the academy, and we check them in order to interrogate where are the women. That's how you change. Um, and this takes a tremendous amount of work in our teaching, in our writing, and in our research. And I think one of the one of the most pernicious ways in which the academy and just even public intellectuals sometimes get away with this is that not enough people ask them, this is a wonderful concept. This is a wonderful exposition of this particular part of history, of this particular political mechanism. But where are the women? What are they doing? And why do we, need, we do not see them exposed in your scholarship? So it requires a constant and incessant um, demand for women to be included. It also requires us to understand political power as something that does not divorce um, the public and the private. If you think, for instance, about the importance of logistics, communications in a military setting, you cannot have military. You can have the biggest weapons if you want. You can annihilate. But in terms of strategy, you still need the human, the connections between individuals, the, the logistics, the communications, the feeding of soldiers. You do not feed your soldiers. You do not have an army. Even if the roles are maintained in this very gendered organization, you have to interrogate the capacity of institution to provide what is not the actual, the actual weapon itself. So what happens between people? So we understand politics too often a way, in a way that is div divorced from the everyday, which in many ways explains why the everyday challenges of women who are away from the public sphere is often neglected. So how do we change this is to change how we conceptualize first, you know, what is important and what is power and what is relevant. And I think the COVID um, event was an ex a perfect example to see what ended up being important. People's ability to eat, people's ability to see one another, people's ability to, to find joy all of a sudden, writers, artists, um, people who provided uh, care became extremely important. We started calling them essential worker. But as relationships normalize and the state reoccupies more masculine position as we think that COVID is over, all that we considered essential is now put at the background. And I think this is one of the ways in which we, um, we change, we change the narrative. And in fact, if we look, and I'm going to finish this here, if we look at the scholarship of somebody like Siva Grovogui, for instance, he actually challenges uh, how we understand uh, sovereignty and legitimacy that is solely focused on this legitimate you know, use of monopoly of force and, and, and demonstrates how even states like Belgium, you know, who actually don't have th this capacity to defend themselves in Europe, are actually recognized simply because there is some sort of consensus. Yeah, so even how we understand the state and political science is a myth. And if we can tease out this myth and look at the fibers that make society, even though, as you know, I have an issue with the, 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 the modern state, but even if we accept it as is, 
if we tease out what makes the state, what makes society, it's far beyond what is public. It is far beyond what is masculine force. And if we can do that and always check our interlocutors to understand the state differently, power differently, but also interrogate where are women incessantly, I think we'll have a change in attitude, a change in how we write, a change in how we teach, and a change in how people understand society more broadly. Um, thank you, Professor Buka. Uh, Shigo, I think you have been answered very well. <laughs> um, Professor Bana, would you like uh, to respond to uh, um, Pumi's questions? Uh, I hope you could hear me now. Yes, we can. Brilliant. So um, the first question which uh, Zetu addressed was really the convergence between LGBT and girls in the, in fact, the ways in which uh, infantilization operates. And of course, the subordination of femininity and the female. And of course, uh, how age then complicates uh, this infantilization, which for me is also premised upon uh, the legacies of, of, of coloniality. I want to focus very specifically now on um, the question about protection. And, um, and it was a really such a sophisticated question in terms of, of asking, so how protection is produced and how it overlaps with, uh, with state and the media laws. And so protection for me, and I have uh, four responses to this. Protection for me, it you know, may do more harm than good because it confounds girls' own decision-making. It denies their ability to, to be sexual or to become sexual. And, um, and also by amplifying sexuality uh, and childhood sexuality, in my case, as a sense of shame. So this is then what protection does. And very often protection legislation, as the question so rightfully pointed to, often backfires and is an absolute contradiction, and then goes on to produce more harm than good. So that's the first point. The second point is that um, when it comes to protection, uh, sexual victimization and protection are oversubscribed to heterosexual girls. And that points directly you know, to what the chapter has been arguing, is that then it reduces girls' agency and again, re, um, reaffirms the state of, 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 of uninterrupted help, uh, sexual helplessness. So under these circumstances then, the um, understandings, uh, you know, female, young female sexuality or sexual pleasure and desire is, is subsumed and is undervalued because the priorities are uh, protection and protection is seen as the only form of agency to so protect yourself from sexuality is seen as the only form of action and agency. Um, and so sexuality then becomes part of these tired dichotomies uh, seen as uh, a domain of suffering and protection then of course is seen as this, um, this authority, um, uh, this authority model that is um, seemingly the only way in which we can know uh, young sexuality and girl sexuality in particular. So finally, what protection does is that it correlates risk with harm. And then as the question pointed out, you know, towards uh, state and media laws, what it does then it, it incites legal interventions and criminal, criminalization and prohibition. And so in, in my, my latest book, uh, and I'm not advertising, although you may see it as that, but, um, and in my latest book, what I do ex is, is exactly this, the ways in which uh, the, the uh, legislation around porn is exactly based on the uh, interventions to block it in order to protect uh, children, girls, and young people. And, and, and protection then is seen as the only way of safeguarding girls and securing their, their sexual health and well-being. And then girls remain under greater surveillance and 
you know, it reinforces this, you know, as I stated earlier, it reinforces a sexual shame and stigma, and it reinforces the need for, for protection instead of also addressing how girls themselves can manage, can accommodate, can act against, um, and or not simply being victims, but also as, 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 as agents. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Professor Bana. Um, I'm going to move on to the last two uh, contributors and uh, Shriko's questions, just for the purposes of time. I don't want to limit you in your responses, but um, please be uh, mindful of time. Um, I think, Shriko, your next question was for Dr. Mulochwa. Um, if you would like to respond to uh, Shriko's questions. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm going to be brief because honestly, the questions are, are quite difficult. I mean, there are questions that require us to think together because they are serious questions, I must admit. And in terms of the first question, I'll, I'll, I'll say patriarchy has a, has a long history and the, but the, it, it has a long history. It goes way back maybe to colonial times or even before. But the kind of patriarchy that I start is under post-colonial conditions where the post-colon you know, is a condition that is articulated by coloniality, capitalism, and even the patriarch of the colonial. So we can see even that of late, the post-colonial is not of late, but around, in the case of Zimbabwe, it was around the 90s, it became neoliberal, like it, it, it adopted the neoliberal ideologies. And my interest is in representation, and I'm interested in representation as arising out of colonial conditions in two senses. First, I'm interested in representation around representation, like in politics, like around the idea of elections. We know that elections are the sort of the keystone or they are central to neoliberal democracy, how neoliberal democracy runs. But we know that they are said to be quite expensive, especially for most, like democracy is expensive most for, for most African countries. And to say democracy is expensive is to say, in another sense, to say, especially for women in Africa, it is expensive for them to, to fully participate in democratic processes. And then the other sense is in the symbolic sense, like we know the institutions of representation, especially the media, they emerge out of capitalist conditions, like their companies, their run as companies, they are after profits, such that the money that they, they expect to get from readers or people who buy newspapers is negligible compared to the money that they want or they target from advertisers and other people who have influence in society. And then in terms of the second question, why do women always come short of seizing power in post-colonial Africa? I think my answer to that will be, it's, it's, it, it all goes back to the strength of patriarchy. I, I mean, I know it might sound, I don't know, but it, it goes back to the strength of patriarchy, like how patriarchy adapts and how it, it is able to reinvent itself in each turn. Today I was reading on Twitter, a news item where the PEC, the Provincial Executive Council in the Northwest, has voted or has decided to disband the ANC Women's League. So thinking about how the sacrifices of women like Charlotte McClake, when they came up with the, the ban to Women's League, I'm just surprised that some people can just sit down and decide to disband, I mean, with this whole history, this long history, it's, disbanding the ANC Women's League is like, trivializing the sacrifices of women or the steps that women have taken over the years to try to reach or to try to seize power. And then in terms of the nation state, it's, it's quite unfortunate that world over we have never had a state that is not patriarchal. To the, to the extent that even when Joyce Banda was president in Malawi, she was in charge of a patriarchal nation state. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Mulosho. I think, Shiko, 
I remember in third year when we spoke about elite patriarchal bargaining and Lindy Wimakunga's work, that's what he's speaking to. Um, and, I, and I think it's very interesting. I, I think you guys will have a lot to speak about when you decide to get together and think through these ideas, as he's indicated. Um, I'm going to give the floor to um, Professor Adejumo to respond to the last question. Thank you very much. Um, first, I don't know if anybody has mentioned, because there's a question that says, what is mainstreaming? And um, gender mainstreaming basically is a fair representation, like I, I, I conceptualize in, as regards the issue of gender budgeting. It's a fair representation of gender, men, women, youths, children, vulnerable groups, aged, and gender issues a fair representation of gender and gender issues in programs, whether national, at firm level, household level, in national issues, international issues. So a fair representation of gender and gender issues in programs, policies, and plans, basically, and for the issue of budgeting in budgets. Now, the issue of gender budgeting in Africa, I understand the, 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 the issue of gender budgeting, must be clarified first. The issue of data budgeting is such that I have a budget I want to plan about or I want to do. And then at the, at the, at, at the, at the level of budgeting, I introduce um, an analytical component that takes care of the differential impact of a program or plan or policy that I want to do, of the effects of that intended program of policy on different groups of categories of persons that are in focus. And um, the, like I noted in the, in the chapter, the issue of gender budgeting is known, but the level of adoption is more of a generalized level of adoption compared to what it actually in, implies uh, it's adoption, it's more of a generalized concept. And what I mean generalized concept, a, a peculiar instance is the Botswana um, example I gave in the chapter. Um, usually what governments do, for instance, because I, I, in my submission, I, I made it clear that all level of constituted governance, whether at firm level, organization, church, mosque, religion, whatever, wherever, the issue of gender budgeting should be a component for um, inclusion for and, and, and reducing discrimination as it were. So it's beyond just um, national issues, but I'll, I'll concentrate on that for now. Now, the issue of, uh, at national level, we discover that if uh, the government wants to um, express itself for gender budgeting, it is usually done institutionally and done maybe through the Ministry of Women Affairs, um, Ministry of um, Finance, or the representation across sectors is missing amongst um, that's by observation, but that can be verified and verified. But usually by, from the readings, it's observed that institutionally, that is the mechanism that most governments are trying to achieve gender budgeting, which so it is largely misconstrued and generalized. And that's the, 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 the position from, from the narratives in Africa. Um, what can, can it be measured? Yes, it can be measured. And uh, based on what it is now, the measurements that you can have is based on maybe the resource allocation and utilization for gender issues. How, the, how resources are allocated, national resources, um, local resources, regional resources, how they are allocated for gender issues. Maybe for instance, if I want to do a study on how resources are being utilized, I can look at the differential impacts on men and women, on children, as it were, like that. Now, but the poser for the future is that if gender budget in, is supposed to be used as supposed to be used, then I see a future where researchers will be needed in this, in, in this regard, because it's a mechanism problem and man, man problem that we actually have, because it's a process. If I take a policy, for instance, and I want to do this policy, a policy of increasing um, maybe 
like I said before the other time, increasing women participation in labor spaces. I would have to, for instance, look at what is happening on ground, introduce the, the components of maybe impact evaluators to take a, a, a stance of what is currently happening and what we want to achieve based on the current resources that we want to dispose. And, I, and the painstaking effort is missing in this context or is largely missing in the African context. Um, what can we do to address it? That's one way we can address it. Um, other ways is that government has to disburse resources for this purpose. They must be willing also to collaborate with researchers, they must be willing also to collaborate with other stakeholders who can actualize this component. And then they must be um, open to evolve that partnership. And then they must be intentional, intentional about it. Not generalizing and just saying, okay, we have allocated to the women, we have allocated for the children, and that takes care of them. That's not gender budgeting in its real context. So for them to actualize it, they must be intentional as it were to do the real thing to, for, for it to bring the development outcomes that we actually crave for. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Adichimo, uh, for your contributions and thank you to all of the, the, the speakers and to the discussants uh, uh, for engaging with the work so excellently. Um, because of time, uh, our Q&A section should be, will be very, very uh, short. I'm going to hand over to our chair, Kanya. The floor is yours. Kanya? Um, sorry, the first question we have is for Prof Zetu from Esile Lupindo, and they're asking, um, Prof Zetu briefly mentioned that they write about a queer future, and right now, Nompumelelo just spoke about the myth of protection. As we make these attempts to work towards a queer future, can we rely on the state to achieve our ideals of the queer future? And then the second question I have is from C. D. Khala to Professor Bana, who is asking, do you think the framing of African girls as vulnerable and therefore lacking agency in terms of their sexuality is the way in which Western scholarship further marginalizes Africa so it can be perceived as the savior? In terms of development programs, um, in terms of the development programs it implements in Africa. Thank you, Kanya. Um, Prof. Matabiani, would you like to respond to that first question? Yeah, sure. Th thank you, Esikha. I mean, I think to be very brief, I would say, no, we cannot rely on the state to imagine. Um, the work of imagination um, <laughs> is, um, I think, can be done outside these kinds of um, structures that, that try to control uh, whether it is through giving the idea or the myth of protection or giving us a legal status etc um so when i when i write about <clears throat> a queer future it is about imagining a possibility of existing beyond what already what already is available particularly for queer persons um and that work in short cannot take place within the confines of what the state provides um, thank you, Professor Matabeni. Um, the second question was for Professor Bana. Thanks very much. That was a really good uh, connection made uh, between the ways in which girls, the reproduction of girls' vulnerability and their passivity actually gives value to uh, Global North endeavors in terms of development programs. And so when girls do succeed, these development programs are seen as key to um, uh, enhancing African girls' agency and success. So there's a, there's a really contradictory connection between, and a, a contradictory, but also a troubling connection between these development programs and the construction of girls as, um, as passive and weak. And we need to ask, 
whose interest does it serve for us to continue this um, myth of girls' lack of agency? Thanks. Um, thank you very much for your, your response, uh, uh, Professor Banner. Um, I am, unfortunately, we have run out of time. So we are going to move into concluding remarks. Um, to be fair, let me open up the, the floor to the speakers and ask if anybody would like to offer um, some concluding remarks. If you would all like to, you have about 30 seconds each. If not, um, those who would like to provide some concluding remarks, uh, please do go ahead. Uh, Dr. Masola, would you like to, to provide any concluding remarks? No, I think just to say thank you to everyone for coming. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Masola. Um, Dr. Buka, I mean, Professor Buka. No, I, uh, I will go ahead and, and thank everyone for organizing this wonderful panel and for everyone in the attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Muloshwa. No, I just want to thank everyone. I think I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak at this forum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Matibeni. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Bana. It is so rare to bring, to have so many people brought together. I'm watching my seconds. I want to say that this has really been such um, a rare and outstanding event thanks to the two editors for such for bringing us all together and thanks to the organizers for bringing over 200 attendees wonderful uh thank you professor banner and professor adichumo yes thank you very much i just want to say development does not just happen it has to be worked out and inclusive development requires everyone thank you Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Adichimo. Um, I am going to hand over uh, for concluding remarks to Dr. Babagwa Makukwana. Um, she is the interim director for the Center for Women and S Gender Studies at Nelson Mandela University. Um, she is a fellow of the African Humanities Program and the research associate of the South African Research Chairs Initiative in Social Policy uh, at the University of South Africa. She is the principal investigator of the Catalytic Project on Maternal Legacies of Knowledge in the Eastern Cape supported by the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences. She was also a recipient of the National Research Foundation First Brand Foundation sabbatical grant for a project on women-centered vernacular sociology of the, um, of the Eastern Cape. Um, Dr. Magbukwana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Shingi. I think everyone is ready to go, but um, wouldn't do justice to the editors, to the contributors, and also the organizing team if we were not to say thank you so much for all the ideas that you have shared. But also, um, I was just struck by the sharing about patience and compassion in the process of writing this beautiful book, uh, which is more than 200 pages in trying to center African women's thinking, you know? So um, in the pressures that we have in the academy to have patience and compassion in the writing process, it needs to be uh, commendable and, and, and also part of the value system that we inculcate daily in how we do things. I'm not going to say everything that I wanted to say, Shingi, um, but I'm just excited <laughs> about the fact that we can negotiate the price with the publishers, especially if we have so many students, uh, 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 first year students and honor students, uh, I'm sure encouraged by you, Shingi, and, and Spogaz from the Department of Politics at Rhodes University, and some of them from Nelson Mandela University. So thank you so much, colleagues. Um, and also, I just wanted to make sure that I thank uh, Professor Msindo. Uh, the Humanities Dean and also the Director of the Center for African Studies at Rhodes. Um, it is through such leadership that we tend to enjoy uh, uh, some sort of support 
for this kind of work uh, in the region. So thank you, Prof. Sindo. I think the co-editors of the handbook, um, Professor Jacob Aliso and Professor Toyin Falola, you have done a stellar of a work. We hope that there will be another volume after this one that can also break some of these global hierarchies around feminism as well uh, in the world to begin to center women from the developing world. To the contributors, Zetuma Tebeni, Yolanda Buka, Kanyele Mlochwa, Atambile Masola, Divya Bana, and uh, Adejumo. Thank you so much, colleagues, for being present. Obviously, our facilitator, beautiful Shingi Mtero. I've got a soft spot, Shingi. She knows it about the work that she does. Uh, excellent work, uh, International Criminal Court. And um, obviously, the respondents were so excellent. Uh, Nompumelelo and uh, Jigon Borero uh, were trying to build the, 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 the alignments between the different papers. I think you both have done excellent work. Um, that actually can be published, colleagues. Uh, please think about uh, putting that together so that you can put it out there. It's such an excellent piece of work. And uh, obviously, uh, my friend, my collaborator, my uh, head of department there in political and international studies department, uh, Dr. Spoga Zmaga, who always manages to bring all of us together in this fashion. So thank you so much, Spogazi, and your team. Kaya Bensnamashe, Spogazi Dao, Offense Make, Nigel Machia, and also obviously Nombumelelo and Jikombarero. And um, colleagues, to everyone that is here, thank you so much for coming. Please keep in touch. And also there's an email on the chat by Phil Getz from Palgrave, who says he is happy to negotiate the prices if you want the actual handbook. So please be in touch, colleagues, and uh, be in touch via email to get that email address. So thank you so much, colleagues, for coming and have a great evening. <laughs>